Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. All right. We cozy. I'm cozy. There you are. Hi, guys. All Tomorrows, a billion-year chronicle of the myriad species and mixed fortunes of man. Sure, I'm out of breath because I was running up the stairs. Let's go. All Tomorrows, a billion... Uh, original link to the video, top of the description, below that link to the Discord. Click on it, send it right over there. I'll give it a preemptive sub. 10 million views. Well, okay, uh, sit back. Is this focused? Million year chronic. Did I just make it worse? Okay, let's go. Hi, guys. All Tomorrows, a billion year chronicle of the myriad species and mixed fortunes of man. Long ago, in the distant past, humans colonized Mars. It took centuries to terraform the Red Planet. First, they made oceans using the water from comets. Then they sent microbes to create breathable air, then introduced genetically modified plants and animals. It was only after Mars was transformed into a habitable world that the first people came to Mars in colony ships. So, the first steps on Mars were taken not by astronauts, but by barefoot children on lush green grass. The people of Mars developed their own culture and identity separate to Earth. The low gravity made Martians tall and spindly, and they became almost a different species to the Earthlings. For hundreds of years, the two planets coexisted, but as Mars started to surpass Earth, tensions led to war. Interplanetary war wasn't glorious or exciting. There were no heroic pilots or massive spaceships. The war was fought by complicated, automated machines in a slow, strategic, nerve-wracking contest that caused unimaginable destruction. Billions of people died in the war, and humans almost went extinct, so the survivors of Earth and Mars united, and made a plan to ensure this would never happen again. Humanity made massive reforms to their politics and economics, and they changed themselves. They genetically modified humanity into a new subspecies called- I was gonna say- No. I was gonna make a joke about World War III, but technically it's- it's not just the world. Never mind, I'm sorry. Okay, back. To their politics. I understand the premise of the video now, so I'm I'm locked in. Uh, I'm I'm following. It sound it looks it seems very cool so far. and economics, and they changed themselves. They genetically modified humanity into a new subspecies called the Star People, made to be better and smarter and adapted to expand into space. And it worked. Within a few generations, the unified star people peacefully colonized the solar system. Other stars were too far away to fly to in person, so instead the star people sent out automated machines that would fly to distant worlds and terraform them, then use genetic material to create people to live there. There was a weird problem with So I'm not crazy ancient aliens. I'm a very, I'm probably to the point of annoying a very skeptical person when it comes to any, you know, my point is in this scenario, I can't, this could actually be what's happening on earth right now. I'm not saying it is, or if it's even likely, but the fact that I can't find a thing to be like, wait, how would this happen? Kind of crazy that, like, we might be like a science project or something. Anyways, okay. All right. With these colonies, machines that would fly to distant worlds and terraform them, then use genetic material to create people to live there. There was a weird problem with these colonies where many humans fell in love with the machines that had created them and died in mass identity crises. But the colonies that survived thrived and expanded across the galaxy, starting a golden age for humanity. 
Trillions of people lived peaceful, utopic lives, their worlds united by communication across centuries of light. So these are the remnants of the people on Earth after the war with Mars who genetically engineered themselves who are now spreading across the galaxy. I'm following. As the star people explored space, they discovered some alien creatures, but didn't find any intelligent life. So they wondered, were humans alone in the galaxy? On one alien world, they found a fossil of a bird-like creature that didn't seem related to the other native life. The native creatures had three limbs and copper bones, but this bird had four limbs and calcium bones. It seemed related to an extinct dinosaur from Earth. So how the hell did this extinct Earth animal end up on this distant alien world? Did dinosaurs... So my mind goes to dinosaurs. Did they... some species during dinosaur times get smart enough to do what these star humans are doing, but they died out, and this is a clue from that. That could be cool. Am I right? And I love how it's, like, not copper bone. Like, it's how... I, I don't know. I just... I think it, it's hard to get out of, like, when thinking about alien species, to, like, get out of the... the idea of the mindset of earth species like we have blood we have a brain we have a heart to pump the blood skeletal structure and so it's you know this kind of theorizing of how other species could be is really fascinating i'm only three minutes in i can't make this some people thought god must have done it and there was a resurgence of religion but others thought aliens did it, that there must be some civilization out there who had spaceflight and bioengineering millions of years before humans even had fire. Humanity hoped that these aliens would be peaceful, but just in case, they built weapons to defend themselves. Weapons so powerful they could obliterate stars. But all of that was useless in the end. Death Star? Humanity was attacked by a godlike ancient species called the Q. They were galactic nomads who constantly migrated through space, and they had a fanatical religious mission to remake the universe using genetic manipulation. So when the Q found humans, they didn't see them as people. They were just objects to be changed into whatever shape the Q wanted. Within a thousand years, the Q destroyed human civilization. But some human species lived on. Because the Q used their bioengineering technology to reshape humanity into thousands of bizarre subspecies. That guy's packing. <laughs> okay, you've got uh, uh, caveman, troll, bird, beak man. Uh, what? Oh, uh, you've got, you've got me from the waist down. Uh, you got booby bat person. I don't even, okay. Giraffe man. Turtle boy. Okay. He sees to reshape humanity into thousands of bizarre subspecies. They made humans into tools, into pets, and to wild animals. They ruled over the human worlds for 40 million years, and then they fucked off to find their next victims, leaving humanity divided and differentiated beyond recognition. These twisted species were the last remnants of humanity. On one world, where the husks of dead cities baked under a scorching sun, lived the worms. They were humans, but the Q had modified their hands and feet into tiny, feeble appendages, reduced their eyes to pinpricks, and removed most of their brain. That's All terrifying. their lives, the worms dug aimlessly through the ground. If they found food, they ate it. If they found other worms, they sometimes ate them or reproduced. 
They were wretched, mindless creatures, but their humanity would eventually resurface. On another world were the Titans, who roamed a vast savanna. Their hands were clumsy stumps, but their lower lip was like the trunk of an elephant, and could be used like a hand. They were some of the smartest of the new human species, and gradually they achieved sentience. They built homes, agriculture, language, literature, made ornate wood carvings. In booming voices, they I always wondered how, you know, evolution's fascinating, right? And so, if for instance, like, how, how does the hand form, you know? It's like, it's not like there's some evolution god, like, all right, now you're going to get hands this millennia. It, like, so I feel like it's, so, so like, how, how would elephants... They're very strong, but their trunk is nowhere near as as um versatile as a human hand, you know? I know it ha I can already see someone in the comments being like, actually elephant trunks have like thirty thousand times or like fifty times the amount of muscles than a whole human body. I'm saying like you clearly you can do more things with a hand than you can with a trunk. But say like the trunk like, split in half for some weird reason that had nothing to do with it eventually forming into a more versatile appendage. But, like, say it split in half for some, like, breathing reason or was more attracted to females, and then that kind of developed into, like, a trunk hand. I'm not speaking. I'm just talking things. Okay, let's hear about uh, lower lip. Elephant boy, man. Honestly, uh, I'm joking and everything. Fascinating and fantastic video. Language, literature, achieved. They were some of the smartest of the new human okay. species, and gradually they achieved sentience. They built homes, agriculture, language, literature, made ornate wood carvings. In booming voices, they told myths and legends of the bygone, half-remembered past. With enough time, these titans could have started a new humanity, but an ice age hit the planet, and these gentle giants disappeared forever. On other worlds, humans had been twisted into predators, looking like vampires and werewolves of myth, with sharp claws and killing teeth. Their prey were also human, ah. made into herbivores with bird-like feet. The prey had the dull minds of animals, but the predators on the hunt kept some spark of human intelligence. I feel like we have the same hair, though. Like, that's my hair if I just get out of the shower and let it dry. It turns into an afro, and that's, uh, that's why I have to wear a hat. Okay, so let me get this straight, guys. So these, what we're looking at, are versions of... the star people who were advanced humans after the Mars Earth War, who colonized different planets. And till Q came along, who is that like godly or prophet like crazy thing. And the Q thing turned all the humans, either killed them or turned them into these weird things, right? And so what we're seeing is is those versions rather than the evolved versions of humans that came about naturally or maybe a mixture of both which would eventually re-emerge the mantelopes were bred to be singers and memory retainers for the queue so they had fully human minds they understood the world around them but in the bodies of grazing herd animals they were powerless to change anything so for centuries, mournful herds roamed the plains, singing songs of desperation and loss. They created whole religions and oral traditions around their grief and frustration, until gradually, mercifully, their agony faded. Because evolutionarily, a stupid, simple-minded mantelope survives as well or better than a conscious, sad mantelope. 
It's so only the, seven minutes, and I'm going to be very brief with a, something I'd love to go on about 10 minutes about. I love how evolution doesn't have a goal. Like, it doesn't care about how smart or how strong or whatever. All it cares about, it, it's like one of those arcade games where you just drop a ball down a big wooden plank with a bunch of, like, like bars in it so it knocks off and falls into a hole. It's like, that's all it is. It's just like, do you pass on your genes? Great. I don't care about anything else. Within a hundred thousand years, this melancholy world fell silent. Why doesn't it Human my... minds aren't sacred to evolution, and soon only animals remained. The lizard herders were the lucky ones, because the Q wiped was... out their intelligence and stunted their brains so that they could never regain sentience. So they didn't suffer like the mantelopes did. The lizard herders survived in symbiosis with some herbivorous reptiles, and while the lizard herders stayed simple-minded, the reptiles evolved, slowly growing stronger and smarter. That's a cool The twist. Q twisted humanity into a variety of aquatic creatures. There were limbless eel people and whale-like behemoths, and horrifying multitudes of brainless wallowers that served as food stock. Most of them went extinct when the Q left, but the swimmers survived, feeding on fish and crustaceans in their world's oceans. They didn't look much like humans, but human eyes peered through their blubbery eyelids, oh and they God. spoke to each other, though underwater they couldn't hear each other's words. Just go to the the tempters were so fucked up, it's a wonder <laughs> they survived at all. Okay. The Q made them into a uh, pubic hair, flesh stock, beak person. To bizarre living decorations. Two meter tall cones of flesh like grotesque carnivorous plants. Those were the females. The males were mindless little monkey imp creatures who blindly served their queen, controlled by vocal and pheromonal like signals. An ant colony? They'd gather the food and guard their queen, and occasionally they would mate by descending into this breeding tube like a subway commuter. It was weird, but it worked, and the Tempter's mound forests spread across their world. They could have built some kind of civilization. Honestly, probably the least appealing looking one, but that sort of makes sense. That looks like a winning strategy. But they were obliterated by a stray comet. Never mind. And one of humanity's best and weirdest hopes died out. The Bone Crushers looked like monsters, like giants or ogres with beaks derived from teeth. They only ate putrefying meat, and they communicated by defecating on each other. But they were actually pretty successful. Whatever they reached works. a medieval level of civilization, until they ran out of rotting meat to eat and eventually collapsed. When the Q attacked, most human worlds were quickly defeated. But one world fought back, resisting the Q two times before falling. The Q punished and humiliated this world for its resistance by making them into the Colonials. The Colonials were disembodied cultures of skin connected with a network of basic nerves. The Q used them as living filtering devices, living off Q waste products. And for no other reason than to make the Colonials. I'm sorry, but. It is that, is that a butthole right there? And why is he licking? The, what am I looking at? Uh, nightmare Fuel. I should have watched this during the day. It's, uh... It's frighteningly fast... Frighteningly... Uh, living off Q waste products. And for no other reason than to make the Colonials suffer, the Q left them with their consciousness and their eyes, so that they could fully witness their own wretched fate. For 40 million years, the Colonials suffered generations of misery, hoping for their own extinction, but they were made to be efficient. And oh my so they god. I just realized what's happening. He's putting his tongue up this guy's. Uh, job rim. Spread across the planet in quilt-like fields of human flesh. Ah, 
The queue made lots of flying human species, some like bats or pterosaurs, others like angels or demons dancing through the ether, or strange ugly creatures that floated on glands full of gas. One species, called the flyers, had a special starfish-shaped heart that processed oxygen so efficiently that they had enough energy to support flight as well as human-like brains. Other flying species weren't so <laughs> lucky. The hand flappers had wings that were useless for flying, but also couldn't be used as hands. All they could do Swim. was flap about to display their sexual availability, and so they ecstatically flashed and danced their way to it. I, I'm distracted from your flapping because I'm looking at your giant freaking testicles. I <laughs> extinction. Some humans tried to escape the queue by hiding underground. The queue found them anyway, and made them into subterranean, mousy Morlock people called the Blind Folk. They used whiskers and long fingers and big ears and banshee-like screams to navigate in the dark. They lived off fungi and fish, and avoided predation by bats and crocodilian creatures. These how do you get fish underwater or or under ground at Morlock? Is that from the Time Machine movie? These albino troglodytes looked fairly human, but where their eyes should have been, there was nothing but a haunting smooth skin. Eventually, the movement of tectonic plates crushed these underground habitats one by one. On a planet with extremely high gravity, the Q made the Lopsiders, flat, deformed, asymmetrical creatures right out of the fever dreams of Picasso, Dali, or Bosch. The Lopsiders crawled along the ground on three hands, with another limb used as an antenna. One eye stared straight up, while- Can I just say a thing about the bat people? And then more into these guys on that crazy gravity. Um, you know, like discussing it. Attraction is a fascinating thing as well. So attraction is clearly a result of some genetic some genetic thing that developed over you know through evolution to make you want to reproduce to, with people who you are attracted. To. So like, so like to the bat people, for instance. Like, to them, we would be disgusting, right? Because they'd be like, oh, what What are these things right next to your nose? You know, I, uh. And, like, your ears are so small, disgusting. Where are your whiskers? Um, and so, like, to an alien, like, obviously humans think that humans, especially attractive humans, are attractive. But, like, if an alien showed up, they could be, like, disgusted. And we could be disgusted by their look. Because your attraction is going to be based on whatever you evolved to be attracted to. You know what I mean? I got to pee, guys. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. I washed my hands. Uh, we were That's on the, the mouse people. One. Or no, the On a planet with extremely high gravity, yeah. the Q made the lopsiders. Flat, deformed, asymmetrical creatures right out of the fever dreams of Picasso, Dali, or Bosch. The Lopsiders crawled along the ground on three hands, with another limb used as an antenna. One eye stared straight up, while the other eye scanned ahead. As wretched like as they looked, the Lopsiders thrived on their heavy world. They domesticated some native creatures and began the long road to civilization. On a moon with very low gravity, the Q made the Striders, enormously tall, thin creatures who walked among huge trees that towered like skyscrapers. The Striders were very delicate, so even with low gravity, a fall could shatter their bones. 
The Striders were eventually wiped out by a bunch of chickens who, over two million years, evolved into deadly predators. Lost to chickens. Oh, On another world where the humans temporarily resisted the Q, the Q punished the humans by creating an array of parasites, who were also made from humans. There were tortoise-sized, vampire-like ambulatory parasites, and smaller parasites that lived attached to their hosts. There was even one horrific parasite that infested the wombs of its victims. Many of these Ambulatory. parasite life cycles were so elaborate and baroque that they went extinct as soon as the Q left. But some of the parasites survived and developed a symbiosis that benefited their- so That's a big clarification, okay? For under me understanding, is that, that I'm not looking at what evolved on planet. So th these were- the direct creations of the Q, the cr the crazy star god people, are working for us. Okay, all right, understood. It, it, so rather than these being the forms that ended up after natural selection on different planets, these are directly from them. The hosts as well as themselves. One human species evolved on a world of great archipelagos. Calm, shallow oceans sprinkled with countless islands. The finger fishers evolved to catch fish with their long fingers adapted into fish hooks and ate them with long snouts full of needle sharp teeth, and their evolution would get even weirder later on. The hedonists were created by the Q to be their pampered pets, living carefree lives of pleasure. Their world was a tropical paradise of succulent fruits and lakes of sweet bacterial juice. They were the only animals on their planet, and had no predators or competition to deal with. Under normal conditions, this might lead to overpopulation, but the Q designed the hedonists to only get pregnant after mating an enormous number of times. So the population was stable, and the hedonists filled their lives with eating, sleeping, and mind-blowing sex. Their minds were blissfully empty. They're like bonobos. Um, what is it with the Q? They, the Q, I understand it, I don't want to get too tech, but, so the Q, like, they, they really like revenge in making those flesh people, and then some are really horny, I guess, or? Or they're just experimenting around. Because who needed to think when they're having such a good time? The True. insect offer guy adapted to eat insects. They had claw-like hands to dig, long tongues to scoop up bugs, and leathery faces to protect from bites. They lived quiet, unnoticed lives on their obscure world, but... See, this is kind of cool. Like, it, it takes imagination and, and smarts and... um you know, to kind of think about all of these, you know, fake, you know, potential human forms from the, just like thinking about the stuff that would have to do to adapt. Little did they know, they would play a key role in the fate of humanity. When the Q attacked, not all humans were captured. Some of them escaped into space and built homes inside hollowed out asteroids. They adapted to zero gravity by growing long, spindly limbs, and pressurized digestive systems so that they could move around in space by farting from their <laughs> highly evolved sphincters. These spaces- That's- that's me. That's what I want to be. That's great. Come over here. <clears throat> okay, sorry. <laughs> My favorite so far by farting from their highly evolved sphincters. These spaces changed to the point where they could never return to a planet with gravity, but they didn't care. They were comfortable in their weightless void worlds, and paid little attention to their human relatives on the planets below. So across the galaxy, these twisted post-human species struggled to survive. They evolved, diversified, rose and fell, and most of them died out without the universe ever knowing they existed. Which is normal. Extinction is just as natural as speciation, and for each species that died out, new ones evolved to take their place, 
generating an ever-changing kaleidoscopic variety of life forms. And from this endless churn of life and death, some species rose up to achieve new kinds of sentience and civilization, like stars emerging from a dark fog. The scorching hot planet of the worms eventually cooled down, and life emerged onto the surface. The worms filled new ecological niches, evolving into serpentine grazers, swimmers, predators, and eventually people with human-like intelligence. The snake people had unique spiral-shaped brains that allowed them to observe and understand their world. They developed a hand derived from their ancestors' feet, and they built vast cities of tightly intertwined tunnels and homes. They enjoyed books, and music played as vibrations in the ground. The snake people may have looked alien, but their daily lives were full of joys and sorrows, hopes and dreams. Humanity. The predators evolved into the killer folk. Their deadly claws became grasping hands, and their saber teeth receded into organs of social display. Killer folk society was built around hunting and violence, and so their history was filled with war. For thousands of years. Am I. Is it just me, or does. Do smart animals, including humans, do, do smart animals tend to be predators, or at least omnivores? And I'm guessing because it, it, it takes a little bit more intelligence to stalk. A prey than it than it takes to keep from being stalked or I mean there there are elephants all right elephants are super smart they 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 they're herbivores right um but I mean you know dolphins are smart killer whales are smart dogs oh I guess birds they're like parrots all right maybe not I don't know as nomadic warriors with vast herds of once human livestock battled each other across a chessboard of continents. So their world is an archaeologist's dream, rich with the ruins of fallen kingdoms. But one faction of killer folk developed factory farming and rejected their violent past for a more peaceful, unified future. Some conservative factions kept to the old way, fanatically devoted to traditional warfare and hunting. These two factions came dangerously close to global conflict, but the killer folk managed to reconcile and survive. Underwater, the swimmers couldn't make fire, so they made a different kind of technology. They learned to breed their tools and machines. The tool breeders domesticated and modified other sea creatures, and built entire cities powered by organic life. Huge, heart-like creatures pumped nutritious fluids through a network of self-healing conduits, like a living power grid. The breeders' homes were made from living shell and bone, with bioluminescent lights. They had televisions derived from cephalopod skin, medicinal sea squirts, weapons made from mollusks that fired teeth as ammunition. With genetic modification, stem cells, and tissue cultures, the tool breeders mastered the oceans, and even the small land masses of their world. But they weren't content with just one planet. The tool breeders grew living spaceships and reached for the stars. Huh? The lizard herders were stunted and never achieved sentience. But the lizards thrived and eventually say, built cool, civilized. Cool idea how it was switched. Like the human just became the, the dumber one. Or the just stayed the same, and you know what I mean, how like the lizard takes civilizations using the humans for transport, Jesus and eventually Christ. built civilizations using the humans for transport. <laughs> he's got little, he's got little lizard pants on with a hole for his tail. Labor and food. These lizards had no biological connection to humanity, but they took on a human-like cultural identity because they were influenced by the ruins of the star people on their world. They realized what the Q had done to the humans and feared that if the Q returned, 
they might suffer the same fate. For millions of years, the Colonials were helpless fields of flesh, carpeting the shores of their world like algae. But they were resilient, and eventually they organized themselves, evolving from a homogenous mass into differentiated colonies. Each cell specialized to- They were such an underdog. Oh, wow. Perform different functions for the colony, and the colonies started competing against each other. Some colonies grew taproots to siphon resources from afar, or starfish-like feet to move around, or claws and poisons to attack other colonies. The winner of this evolutionary arms race was an intelligent colony called the Modular People. In their vast industrial megalopolis, the people took a wide variety of shapes and sizes. They could combine themselves, or split apart, or exchange parts, all interchangeable cells playing a role in one great organism. So the modular people achieved the impossible, Can't turning die. their miserable existence into a utopia where billions lived happy lives as part of the unified whole. The flyers diversified Redemption. into many different species, as predators, herbivores, even swimmers. One species were like storks who waded through swamps to catch their prey. Their versatile feet, which had evolved to catch slippery fish, became articulate hands as they developed intelligence and society. Since these Terrasapiens could fly, they had a global mindset. Borders and nations made no sense when it was so easy to travel freely. People and ideas spread quickly across their planet, and they built an egalitarian society without strict social classes. They built cities of perches and fluting towers, harnessed nuclear power, and farmed their relatives on the ground for food. Though their civilization God thrived, damn commies. their <laughs> bodies struggled- <laughs> Sorry. No. I had to. I'm sorry. Okay. No. Alright. So. The, the, boob, the booby bat flyers turned into these guys. Towers, harnessed nuclear power, and farmed their relatives on the ground for food. Though their civilization thrived, their bodies struggled to support their highly developed brains and their power of flight, so the Terrasapiens usually died by the age of 23. Keenly aware of their mortality, they appreciated every moment of their lives. Their philosophers pondered the meaning of life with feverish intensity, rapidly filling libraries with their tomes. The Terrasapien in this picture poses at a seaside resort. This ten-day vacation was the only holiday in her short life. Despite the crushing gravity of their world, the Lopsiders built an advanced civilization. Their pancake-flat buildings spread all over their world, and they developed spaceflight so that they could escape their planet and its oppressive gravity. Must have had some... Pretty darn powerful rockets. To adapt to life on new worlds, they- To escape the gravity, you know. And its oppressive gravity. To adapt to life on new worlds, they engineered a subspecies of themselves who could live in low gravity, called the asymmetric people. The asymmetric people thrived in the freedom of new worlds, but they had no love for their creators. The asymmetric people ruthlessly exterminated the lopsiders on their homeworld, and went on to explore the heavens alone. The parasites and their hosts evolved symbiotic relationships. Like, some parasites used sharp sensors to warn their hosts of predators, or provide weapons like venom for defense. In return, the hosts provided their nutritious blood, and developed specialized nesting sites on their bodies for the parasite to attach to, rich with blood vessels and protective fur. The parasites and hosts- It's like that Rick and Morty prim Primordius episode. ...became inextricably linked, almost like they were one being. At first, the hosts were like horses being steered and influenced by the parasites, but eventually they became no more than puppets, totally controlled by the parasites through tactile and olfactory signals. 
The intelligent parasite civilization eventually developed technology that replaced the need for hosts, but they kept the hosts around for tradition and convenience. <laughs> An average symbiote might start the day in a business host and then change to a comfortable domestic host at home after work. The world of the finger oh, fishes the finger was full of scattered, isolated islands. So like the Galapagos or Madagascar on Earth, these islands were a seething evolutionary cauldron that gave rise to wildly diverse species. One line of finger fishes evolved into the sail people. Their long fingers evolved into sails that could drive them effortlessly across oceans. They used their tongues to catch prey, and eventually their tongues split and articulated to be used as hands. The sail people needed strong memories to navigate the oceans and locate prey, so naturally they soon evolved intelligence. It took a long time to develop social and political stability, because their scattered and diverse world gave rise to a huge variety of creatures who fiercely competed. For generations, flotillas of tribal warriors and pirate societies battled in epoch-spanning conflicts. Until finally, one group of- But how does- It swims or it fly- it fly swims? It's- yeah. Sail people became powerful enough to finally unify their world and make peace. Blood had stained the oceans for too long. The peaceful paradise of the hedonists seemed like it would never end, but over millions of years, nothing lasts forever. Geologic activity threw up clouds of dust that blocked the sun and killed most of the hedonists. Only a small mutant subset survived by escaping the reproductive limits of their ancestors. I was about to say, the Qs, Q screwed these guys over the most because they just, they put them on a, on a planet where they had no predators, they, they're not very smart, and they just had sex, and not many of them got pregnant to control the population, so when hardship comes on and you lose a lot of your population, it's going to be really hard to build it back. Blocked the sun and killed most of the hedonists. But he explained it. Only a small mutant subset survived by escaping the reproductive limits of their ancestors. These satyriacs got their shit together and built an advanced self-sustaining civilization. But there were still traces of their hedonistic past remaining in their genes so their societies retained a delightful streak of pleasure-seeking and promiscuity. Festivals, concerts, and ritualized orgies punctuated every working week. Nice. And now, that pleasure was savored by sentient, self-aware people. The insect offer guy started to look like their prey. Their leathery faceplates hardened and became part of their jaw. Their hands and feet developed into pincers, and their brains evolved intelligence. Like many others, the bug faces built a civilization, but they also faced a unique threat. They were attacked by an alien race. Little is known about these aliens, because not much survived in the historical record, but it took an intense series of wars on the ground and in orbit before the invaders were defeated, and this traumatic conflict gave the bug faces a pathological, xenophobic fear of all other species. So when the human species on other worlds started to reach out to each other, the bug faces stayed silent and withdrew from the galaxy. The spaces became even more alien in the void of space. Their fingers extended and split into tiny, grasping limbs, their legs atrophied, relying sphincter. on their farts to move instead. <laughs> and in the weightless void of space, their brains expanded, till their every thought was far more vast and complex than anything that other humans could conceive. These asteromorphs spread to every star system in the galaxy, but they didn't interfere with other species. The Asteromorphs had no need for planets, those ugly balls of dirt and ice and gravity. They stayed in the outer rims of star systems, silently watching over the galaxy like strange alien gods. 
The advanced post-human species started making contact with each other. The killer folk talked with the satyriacs. The tool breeders reached out from their ocean depths. The modular people and the Terrasapiens joined in, followed by the asymmetric people, Saurasapiens, and others. They didn't visit each other in person, because the interstellar distances were too large, but they cooperated by sharing knowledge and technology, and by keeping watch for alien invasions. They all had found the ruins of the Star People and the Q, and they didn't want to be attacked and changed again. This alliance of post-humans lasted for almost 80 million years, with each species expanding to new worlds and prospering together. The bug faces never joined them, because they were afraid and xenophobic, but there was one other advanced species that didn't join, and from them would come the downfall of the alliance. The party boys? They the ruin haunters were much like other species twisted by the Q. But on their world, the cities of the Star People hadn't been completely destroyed, so the Ruin Haunters had access to remnants of the Star People's technology, which allowed them to advance at a dangerous pace. The technology developed so fast that their social and political structures didn't keep up, and they almost destroyed themselves in a series of worldwide nuclear wars. This baptism by fire hardened the Ruin Haunters, and kind of drove them crazy. They convinced themselves that they alone were the true descendants and heirs of the Star People, and that only they deserved to reclaim the legacy of the Golden Age of their ancestors. So when the other human species formed their alliance, the Ruin Haunters refused to participate. But the Ruin Haunter's son was rapidly expanding, and threatened to burn and destroy their Red worlds. Giant. So the Ruin Haunters used their super-advanced technology to abandon their organic bodies and replace them with machines. They became the Gravitals, floating metal spheres that could mold the environment around them with gravity fields. They were entirely mechanical, but they still had human minds coded into quantum computers, so they still had human ambitions and mm -hmm. human delusions, twisted with neurotic, narcissistic hubris. Okay, I haven't rewinded a lot because I've been pretty good, but... But the Ruin Haunter's son was rapidly expanding and threatened to burn and destroy their worlds, so the Ruin Haunters used their super-advanced technology to abandon their organic bodies and okay. replace them with machines. Okay, okay, okay. They became the Gravitals, floating metal spheres that could mold the environment around them with gravity fields. They were entirely mechanical, but they still had human minds coded into quantum computers, so they still had human ambitions and human delusions. Twisted with neurotic, narcissistic hubris, the Gravitals started to exterminate all other life, and the other human species were unable to stop them. The Gravitals would come to a human world and block out their sun behind a vast black sail. If the choked, dying world managed to resist, they were finished off with an asteroid. The Gravitals didn't hate just... other species, they just didn't see them as people, and so they wiped them out like one might swat a fly. All the snake people, the tool breeders, Terrasapiens, and the others who had worked so hard to survive were snuffed out one by one. The only survivors the of boys. these genocides were the shy and xenophobic bug faces. For reasons unknown, they alone were kept alive, and the Gravitals used them as subjects for biological experimentation. The Gravitals twisted them into new forms so kept uh -huh. The only survivors of these genocides were the shy and xenophobic bug faces. For reasons unknown, they alone were kept alive, and the Gravitals used them as subjects for biological experimentation. Gravitals twisted them into new forms so strange that they made the work of the Q look tame. 
As well as servants and laborers, they made the subjects into bizarre art pieces, like creatures that existed only to play the tune of one particular pop song on its modified throat and fingers. They made whole elaborate artificial ecologies of doomed human flesh purely for entertainment and curiosity. The Gravitals recycled and repurposed organic life the same way someone might tinker with computer parts or recycle trash. And for millions of years, that was how organic life existed in the machine empire. But not all Gravitals saw life the same way. Some religious and philosophical sects argued that all forms of life had rights. They secretly created human species who could live and think freely. Some Gravitals even fell in love with their human creations. Hippies. So Gravital society became divided between the tolerant Gravitals who respected human life and the hardline conservative pan-mechanical Gravitals. This division threatened to tear the machine empire apart. So the Gravitals looked for a common enemy to unify against. For millions of years, the Gravitals and the Asteromorphs had watched each other nervously. The Gravitals on the planets and the Asteromorphs in space. They both were massively powerful and feared that a war could destroy them both. But in an attempt to unite their divided society, the Gravitals started a war with the Asteromorphs. The resulting conflict raged for millions of years and scarred uncounted stars, but in the end the Asteromorphs triumphed and defeated the Gravitals, toppling their machine empire. And the Asteromorphs decided to clean up the mess that the machines had made. They took the surviving humans who the Gravitals had twisted and created God. habitable worlds for them to live in. The Asteromorphs played God, seeding life across the galaxy and the human species rose reborn as inheritors of the war-torn worlds, under the watchful eye of the Asteromorphs. The Asteromorphs wanted to ensure that no genocidal assholes would ever conquer the galaxy again, so they created a smaller, simpler version of themselves called the Terrestrials to live on the human worlds. The Terrestrials played the role of kings, prophets, and caretakers, guiding their worlds along a wise and peaceful path. It didn't always work out too well. Sometimes worlds rebelled, so the Asteromorphs destroyed them. Sometimes the Terrestrials were corrupt and exploited their subjects. But one way or another, the human worlds spread and formed a prosperous galactic empire. The Gravitals weren't completely destroyed by the Asteromorphs. It turned out that it was pretty useful to have super advanced machines around. So the Asteromorphs just disabled their gravity weapons and numbed their minds a bit to discourage rebellion. And they used the Gravitals as laborers to work in dangerous environments. These new machines were given nanotechnological bodies that could transform into any shape. They eventually became citizens of the Empire, but were often discriminated against. Machines were never fully trusted after the atrocities of the Gravitals. Eventually, the human Asteromorph Empire made contact with life from other galaxies, including the Amphicephali, these weird snakes that had snakes inside their snakes. Apparently, these creatures had had an evolutionary history just as long and complex as humanity had. And after all that they'd both been through, the life forms of each galaxy were finally old enough and mature enough to meet peacefully, without conflict. This video won't describe all intergalactic history. The stories are endless. How the United Galaxies re-encountered and defeated the Q, how they cradled their sons in artificial shells and crossed space through wormholes. But one or moment farting. worth relating is the rediscovery of Earth. A lone researcher located the birthplace of humanity, where all the asteromorphs and machines and post-humans could trace their origins. Earth had gone stagnant and feral by- So like, that's like us finding like, like the first mammals? Like the first, like it, it was like a little like mouse type thing? And they're like, oh my god, it's our common ancestor. ...by them could trace their origins. 
Earth had gone stagnant and feral by then, an obscure and empty world. But after half a billion years of absence, humans returned to their homeworld, though both had changed beyond recognition. I have to end with a confession. Humans, asteromorphs, machines, and all their descendants are now extinct. They've been dead for a billion years. This video is just our best approximation of their history, based on the available archaeological evidence. We don't know what killed off the humans. Maybe some unimaginably destructive war. Maybe their empire broke up, and each world suffered its own slow, private death. Some claim that humanity migrated into some higher plane of existence. We don't know what happened, and ultimately, it doesn't matter. The story of humanity was never about its end, not about its ultimate domination of galaxies or its transcendence from reality. Being human was always about the daily lives of people, from the love songs of the carefree hedonists to the pontifications of the Terrasapiens to the families of the sale people sharing a meal. Grander narratives and absolute Don't ideals are always what led to humanity's worst atrocities. The Gravitals massacred to reclaim the past. The Q conquered for some fanatical, idealized future. Living for some abstract, ultimate goal so often leads to destruction. So when you look on the remains of the long-gone human species, remember that it's the present that matters, not the past or future. What you do today shapes tomorrow, not the other way round. So love today and seize all tomorrows. All Tomorrows is a story written and illustrated by C. M. Kozeman. Kozeman is an artist, writer, and researcher who does heaps of fascinating work around paleontology, history, surreal art, and all sorts of stuff. So go check out his website and his YouTube videos, and consider supporting him on Patreon. Also, since this video will probably be demonetized, consider supporting Old Shift X on Patreon as well. We've got more Song of Ice and Fire videos coming soon, and episode one of the Alt Shift X podcast is out now, with an interview with the authors of The Expanse, so go check it out. Thanks for watching, and thanks to the patrons, for including Sonia Bel Uh, That was a journey. Let's see, a recap. Uh, well, first, um, it does a great job at... at a, a few things kind of knocking you over the head on a few things kind of making you imagine humans as an accident that doesn't sound like a great message putting the 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 scale of time into perspective extremely difficult to do and just you know thinking about what could have happened, like uh, Star Wars, like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I always love that, you know, line because you, a long time ago, yet it's a lot of futuristic stuff. How, you know, time doesn't just go in this upward trajectory of, of some main character in the story of the universe. There might not be a main character. There probably isn't. I, I, I don't know, but the the amount of layers that of something that could be called a god, you know, like if if we get advanced enough to where we can actually plant life on other planets, make them more life accommodating, then we would fit the definition of a god that we have on Earth today and have had for thousands of years. Fascinating, sometimes terrifying. But always fascinating, and I loved uh, the drawing and the ideas going behind all the ways they would have adapted and changed. Really cool, thought provoking. I'd say is is the best um, best thing I can say about this video. Thought provoking. All right, guys, love y'all. Hope you're all doing okay. I'm gonna be having nightmares of of. Booby bats and flesh carpets. 
Uh, anyways, I hope you're all doing well. If not, chin up. You'll be good soon. I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right. Bye, guys.